How's it going YouTube? It's Elliot here. Welcome back to the channel and welcome to another Elliot Reads video guys. I am going to be doing my October and November wrap ups um, because I didn't have enough time to do them separately so I'm putting them together because it's December now so yeah. I'm putting them two together so we're going to go through the books I read for the month of October and the month of November. I've read three in October and two in November so I'm going to go through them, give my ratings, opinions and all that stuff like I always do. So yeah. And I'm sorry there's been no videos for like 13 days when this goes up. Yeah, 13 days when this goes up. I've really just not had the motivation to do it. Like, do YouTube at the moment, guys. I just really have not had the motivation. I'm sure every content our content creator gets like this, but at the moment I've just had no motivation to record and edit videos. I really haven't. And I've been super busy, so that's another reason why I haven't been around as much on YouTube. He has a video, woohoo, and it's officially December so I hope you are having a good start of your festive season and if you don't celebrate um, the festive season I hope you're having a nice December so far anyways. But yeah we're gonna go through the books that I read in this month so let's get to it, let's do it. The first book I read in October was Pet Cemetery by Stephen King. This is about a family called The Creeds who moved to Maine because the husband, Lewis, has got a new job at the university being like a medical attendant there. So they move there so he's closer to the job so it's easier for him to get to. And when they move in, they meet the guy who lives across the road from them called Judd and his wife, Norma. So they all get introduced to each other and they become quite close to Norma and Judd. Once they move in and Judd's talking about the house and who used to live there and the road that's beside the house, he's saying like a lot of pets have died there and things and it's a very dangerous road. So he's saying, make sure you keep your kids away from the road and any pets that you've got, make sure you keep them away from the road because obviously they've got a cat. Winston Churchill, who the nickname Church. They're in the garden talking with Judd, the front garden talking with Judd. Ellie, the little girl, notices a pathway leading away from their house, like at the side of their house, leading up to like a forested area. So she's curious and she asks her parents what it is. And Judd is like, oh, well, that's the pathway up to the pet cemetery where people have buried the pets that have died on this road. That's why I was telling you to be careful about this road because it's very deadly. There's big, massive trucks that come around here regularly and they're very dangerous and they don't stop. <laughs> so, yeah, be careful. And Judd thinks it's a good idea to take them to look at the pet cemetery for some reason. So he takes them up to the pet cemetery once they get moved in and they're all settled for a little bit. Ellie starts questioning like the safety of a cat so she becomes worried about that church is going to get run over by the big trucks and that he's going to die and the father and the mother have to like reassure that's not going to happen he's going to be fine they're going to get him new ad so he doesn't want to wander as much so he'll be safe and she doesn't have to worry so it puts her mind at ease for a little bit lewis um creed who is the husband starts his first day at work at the university and on his first day of work it's hectic and he gets the cyclist who comes in with his head half like caved in because he's been run over when he's been on a run. While Lewis is alone with this guy, the guy starts talking to him and tells him that there's a place beyond the pet cemetery that's really, really spoiled and dangerous and to not go to this place ever, no matter what happens, to not go to this place. So Lewis thinks he's just hallucinating, so he's like, mm, that didn't happen, that's just, that's just weird. This guy, unfortunately dies then lewis just thinks nothing of it he's like okay well this guy's died it's unfortunate we've lost this guy we couldn't help him we couldn't get into the hospital in time it's happened it's done so yes yeah, so after that thing happens then lewis goes home as normal tells his wife about it and he's, she's like oh that's a shame that's unfortunate thanksgiving comes around as we progress in the story thanksgiving comes around lewis's wife and two children go and visit rachel's parents who's the wife they go and visit Rachel's parents, but Lewis stays behind because he's got things to do at the university. So he tells them to just go ahead because him and his parents-in-law do not get on. So they never liked him. They just think he's not good enough for their daughter. So Lewis spends Thanksgiving with Judd and Norma and has a nice meal with them. And then once he's had that meal, he goes over home for a nap. Later on in the evening, he gets a call from Judd telling him that church has been run over on the road and he's currently on Judd's loan. So he's like, oh no, how am I gonna tell Ellie that a cat's been run over? Cause she loves that cat and she was freaking out that he was gonna die. He goes over to see if this is church and unfortunately it is. And Judd says to him, 
because you help Norma, bag up the cat and follow me. So that's what they do. They bag up the cat and he follows Judd wherever he's going. And Judd leads him up to the pet cemetery and then he leads him beyond the pet cemetery. And he takes him to a Micmac burial ground. The one that this guy, cyclist guy, warned him about to not go to and to not do anything here that could piss off any spirits or anything that's residing there. But obviously he doesn't listen and he goes up there and Judd tells him to bury the cat there. So that's what he does. He buries the cat and then they go home and Judd's like, right, we'll just wait, see what happens. So they go home and he goes to bed and the next morning, church is there. He's back alive, he's been resurrected. Like the freaking Jesus cat, like he is. But he's very different, he's like got a really big personality change he's not like the same church that they used to but he's he's like okay the cat's alive that's fine so he goes on normal and when his family get back the little girl notices like obviously the cat smells and it's a bit weird but he's just like oh he's probably just been rolling around in something it's nothing don't worry about it they will carry on as normal and then lewis his wife rachel his daughter ellie and his son Gage are all in the front garden. Gage thinks it's a good idea. He's only little. He's only like two. So Gage thinks it's a good idea to run down next to the road. And Lewis tries to run after him. But obviously Gage being the way he, being young thinks it's a game. So he's laughing and giggling and he's carrying on like running. And he's getting closer and closer to that really, really dangerous road. And there's a truck coming. You can see where this is going, can't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You see where this is going. So Gage is running, Lewis can't catch up to him, he goes in the middle of the road, the truck comes and it happens. Unfortunately, it captures, captures Gage and he is unalived, which is very unfortunate and very sad. So he takes Gage up to the Micmac burial ground and buries him the same way he did with Church and then he goes home and the next day... Gage comes back to life but of course he's evil because whatever's in this burial ground is very very evil and dangerous. Gage comes back not normal like Church did and Ellie's having nightmares of the the runner who got knocked over who told Lewis it was a bad idea to bury anything in that ground so that guy comes to Ellie and he's in her dreams and says your father needs help but it's gonna be too late. And he, keep, he keeps repeating that to Ellie. So Ellie tells her mum and Rachel has a bad feeling. And while she's on her way home, she rings Judd and asks Judd, have, have you seen Lewis? Um, he's planning to do something silly and I don't know what it is, but I have a really bad feeling about it. And Judd's like, I think I know what he's going to do. So I'll stay up and I'll keep guard to see if he comes back with but he doesn't say what, but he's thinking he's man. I'll stay up and make sure he doesn't come back with Gage's body. So I know what he's planning to do. He's planning to go up that Micmac burial ground and bury that kid. So he comes back to life. Which he did. And unfortunately, Judd falls asleep. So he doesn't catch Lewis coming back with Gage's body and burying him there in the Micmac burial ground. Judd wakes up. He's realised that he's fell asleep. He's like, oh, shit. I fell asleep. He's probably already done it by now. And then he has little footsteps. He has a little kid. It's like, Gage, is that you? And of course it is Gage. But Gage is demonic and possessed by some evil spirit. And he ends up unaliving Judd in his home. So when Rachel gets there, she goes to Judd's house to get the story of what's actually happened. And what was the bad thing she had that Lewis was going to do. Because she knew that Judd knew something. But when she goes in, she obviously finds Judd unalive and she sees Gage there in Judd's house. So she's like, oh my God, it's Gage. I can't believe it's Gage. And then obviously she goes to cuddle him and obviously Gage unalives his own man because he's a possessed little demon child. And then when Lewis finally wakes up, he sees Rachel's car outside of Judd's house. So he's like, hmm, that's a bit weird. Rachel's not meant to be home. Um, and if she was home, she would have came here. So why haven't I seen her? So he sh- he goes over to Judd's house and obviously finds both Judd and Rachel unalived. And, that, and then he knows 
that it's Gage because Church came back and weird and not normal. So he's like, Gage has come back the same. So he, he puts morphine in a syringe and obviously he's going to dose the child with it so he, he, he's unalived again. He's no more, which he does. And then he grabs Rachel and sets Judd's house on fire. So there's no evidence there of what happened. And he goes up to the Mi'kmaq burial ground again to bury Rachel, which isn't a freaking good idea because all the other two have become back possessed and weird. So it's not going to be any different for Rachel. But he thinks it's going to be different because he's in this trance now. That's just like, yeah, this burial ground's calling him to just bury these people here and tell them that it's going to be okay and that they're going to come back and it's going to be normal again. But of course it isn't. But yeah, that was Pet Cemetery. Really good book. Really, really interesting. I can see why a lot of people like Stephen King's writing. He is a very good writer. And his stories are very engaging. I couldn't put the book down. I really enjoyed it. And I gave it four stars. So that was the first book I read in October. Okay, guys. The second book I read was It, again, by Stephen King. And this is about a group of kids who call themselves the Losers Club. And they're all outsiders and misfits. So the coming together to form this group called the Losers Club. Before they formed this group as the Losers Club, one of the guys in the group called Billy, his brother goes outside to like float a boat that they had built together, but he can't go out because he's sick when this happens. So he sends Georgie out with the boat to go and have fun in, in the rain and things and like see if the boat floats. So Georgie does this and He's following the, the boat down like a current, going down like the drain cyst, like going down the drain down the street. And unfortunately, it goes into an open drain in the street and he loses it. So he's like, oh no, but he's going to kill us. He really likes that boat and he built it for me and he's going to be really upset that I've lost it. So he tries to like try and figure out where the boat's gone and see if he can get it back. He sees a set of glowing eyes in the drain and he's like, who the heck's, what the heck's that? Then a clown pops up in the drain and asks him, to come down and visit them in this drain pipe. He's got loads of candy and snacks down here and balloons and it's all a good time. And he's like, come on, Georgie, will you float too? Come down here, it's a good time. He's like, no, I don't, I'm not allowed to take things off strangers. I'm not allowed to talk to strangers. And then obviously Pennywise introduces himself to Georgie. He's like, we know each other now, we're not strangers. Come on, come down here with me. And obviously Georgie's hesitant, but so he's like, no, I don't want to do this. So he's like, I've got to go. I'm sorry. And, he's, and the clown's like, oh, without your boat. And he holds the boat up and he's like, do you want your boat back? And he's like, yes, please. So obviously he goes to grab the boat and Pennywise pretty much chomps his arm off and like pulls him into the sewer and unalives him, unfortunately. After Georgie goes missing, it like kind of dies down. So they just think Georgie's gone missing. They don't think anything like since has happened to him. Um, until like quite far later when they can't find him, they haven't found a body or anything. The kids that are in the Losers Club, they start seeing hallucinations of all their fears and then sometime after the hallucinations happen, they see Pennywise after this hallucination. They don't tell anyone because everyone thinks they're going crazy. The adults can't see what they see because in Beverly's case, her bathroom gets filled with blood and she tells her dad that, oh my god, the bathroom's filled with blood. The sink was filling up with blood and I can't do anything. I don't know what happened. But when he goes to look at the sink, he can't see it. It's only these seven kids that can see it in this loser's group. Obviously, they form this group together and Bill's like, I want to go and kill this thing. I want to get payback for what I did to Georgie and all these other kids that are going missing. Before Georgie and after Georgie, because it, it kills a few people. And then goes dormant for 27 years and then comes back and does the same again. They go into the sewers because they find out where this Pennywise clown demon thing is. And they all go and try and defeat this clown once and for all. So they all go down there and, and they come face to face with Pennywise and they kind of defeat him. Um, they use like silver rock things to defeat him because they believe that like... I don't know why because he's not like a werewolf so I don't know why silver would defeat him but it does apparently and so they think they've done it they think yes we've done it we've killed him we've got him and then once they come out of the sewers being victorious of finishing off Pennywise like if we didn't kill him and if he does come back after another 27 years we've got it all promise that we will come back here after those 27 years and finish him off like for once and for all 
So they all agree on it, they all shake on it, they're all like, yep, fine, we'll do that. Then they all go their separate ways. And 27 years later, it happens again. A child goes missing. And so Mike, who has resided in the town all this time, who was part of the Losers Club, calls up all of them. He calls up Richie, Eddie, Stan, Beverly, Ben and Billy. He rings up all them and says, it's happened again. It's back. We didn't kill it. So you all have to come back to Derry. So they all agree and they all start making their way to Derry. Apart from Stan. Stan always had second get second thoughts about this whole thing. He didn't want to do it in the first place. But they all forced him into it. And obviously he doesn't want to do it as an adult either. Once they set foot back in Derry. They start having their hallucinations all over again as adults. And they start seeing Pennywise all over again. And it obviously brings a lot of traumatic experience for them. So they formulate another plan to go back down to the sewer. Where they originally found Pennywise. And kill him off once and for all. But of course it doesn't come without sacrifices and a few of them don't make it to the end unfortunately but they do defeat Pennywise once and for all and they have saved the town of Derry which is really really good. Yeah that obviously is the story pretty much of it and the book is really really good. I gave the book a five star. Fantastic writing, fantastic story, keeps you gripped in, it's very very good horror, awesome awesome book, really enjoyed it, so that was the second book I read for the month of October. Okay guys, the third book I read for the month of October is My Roommate is a Vampire by Jenna Levine, and this is about Cassie who is pretty much a failing artist, she run, works two jobs because she cannot afford rent and she's getting evicted from her current home, so she's on like the internet trying to find a place to live. And she comes across a advert on Gumtree or something like that, like an apartment with a guy, and he's only charging like two hundred pound a month to live there. Well, two hundred dollars, two hundred pounds, whatever you want to say, say. But I'm British, so I'm going to say pounds. So he's charging her like two hundred a month to live there. So his friends it a bit weird, and her friend finds it a bit weird. But he's like, "What have you got to lose? It's cheap, and you can't really afford anything that's higher than that, so go for it. Meet this, gu- meet this guy, look at the apartment, see what you think. So she's like, okay, fair enough, I will. So she goes to the apartment, meets the guy who has the apartment, and looks around. He's, she's like, there's nothing out of the ordinary. He seems okay. He's a bit weird, but he's he doesn't seem like a mass murderer or anything, so that's fine. That's fair. But what she doesn't know is that Frederick, who owns this house, is actually a vampire so he tells her that he's never going to be around throughout the day because he's up all night doing work and he sleeps through the day so he's like yeah I do night shifts so I don't really I'm not really around throughout the day so you've got the apartment to yourself throughout the day I'll be sleeping so please don't make a lot of noise throughout the day because I'll be sleeping okay fair enough obviously she moves in with them and things are going great they communicate through like letters because they never see each other really and she starts to like fall for the guy because she thinks he's really handsome and like really nice because he does like he's really gentlemanly because obviously he was born like years ago so he's very gentlemanly from the men in her era (laughs) so she becomes really attached to him and like really really falls from really quickly one day when she comes back for her sketchbook which she forgot to get for work she finds bags of blood in the fridge she freaks out and she's like what the fuck explain yourself why is the bags of blood in your fridge and then he's like okay i'm gonna come clean i'm a vampire and stuff like this and the reason that i put that advert out was i needed someone from this century to help me survive in the modern world as a vampire so she's like oh my god she's still freaking out she doesn't know what to do on the fence about if she should stay and help him or if she should run for the hills but she decides to stay and help him navigate the modern world and obviously they both fall for each other and get into a relationship even though he's like 300 years old and she's like in her 20s or some something it's crazy but yeah that's pretty much the gist of the story and it was really really fun it was a really fun read i really enjoyed it it was really sweet it was so funny like it was was just the comedy of it It was just so good the story was really funny and i just really enjoyed the characters they were really really cool really enjoyed it it was awesome really highly recommend that book it was really good i didn't think i would enjoy it because it's like a chick flick book romance book but 
It was alright, I really enjoyed it, it was cool. So I gave that one four stars, I think. Yeah, four stars, I gave it four stars. So how do you recommend it? That um, are the three books that I read in October. Let's move on to November. Okay guys, the first book I read for the month of November, I read two books in November, and the first book I read was Dial A for Aunties by Jessie Q. Satano. This is about a woman called Medi, and she is Indonesian slash Chinese. She is very family orientated. She believes that her family's cursed because all the men in her family have either left or they have been unalived. So she believes there's a curse on her family and all of her cousins who are male have left their families, their mothers, and have moved far away from them. And she feels really bad um, that she wants to move away and go to university. She can't do it to her mum like our cousins did to their to their mums. So she's like, I can't do that to my mum and my auntie, so I'm going to stay here. And Medi doesn't have a very good love life. She did have a partner in university called Nathan. He got a, an apprenticeship sort of thing with a really, really big company in New York and he asked Medi to go with him because they were like soulmates that loved each other very much. But she was scared to abandon her family like her cousins did so she broke up with them just because she was scared. Yeah, she breaks up with him and tells him to go to New York and that she doesn't want to be with him anymore. So Medi is really into photography so when she stays here and does a degree at the university her family has an idea of going to a family business and they become wedding coordinators. So her mum does the flowers, one of her aunties does the baking, the other does hair and makeup and the other one does entertaining and, and the last auntie becomes the wedding planner. So they oversee everything and make sure everyone's being where they need to be and things are getting done on time in the wedding and things like that. And obviously Medi is going to be the photographer so she's going to take photos. So she agrees and they have a really big wedding coming up for an Indonesian couple. And before the wedding happens, a mum signs her up to a dating app and pretends to be her and sets her up on a date. So she goes on this date with this guy who she has absolutely no idea about him because it was her mum that was pretending to be her. So she goes on this date and he's a bit of a creep. He's really nice throughout the night and then wants the leave to go becomes really creepy and he tries to s air in the car so he tries to take her to this secluded spot where no one knows where she's going to be and basically tries to s air and the r word her so she tases his ass because she's got she always carries a taser around because obviously you can't be too careful in these day and ages so she tases him and he crashes the car and unfortunately she thinks he's dead. So she puts him in the boot of her car and drives him to her mum's house and she's like, mum, I've done something bad and I don't know what to do. She tells her mum, she shows her mum this guy in the boot and she's like, yeah, he tried to get like touchy-feely and I kind of tasered him and he crashed the car and now he's not alive anymore. So she rings the aunties and the her mum and the aunties try and help her cover up this murder, basically. Their plan is to put him in the fr- in a fridge that the auntie who runs the bakery has. So they take him over to the auntie who has the bakery's house and they stuff him in a fridge um, because they need to dispose of this body at some point, but they can't do it at, when it was because it's like in the middle of the night and they have to be up early for the wedding, which is the next day. So they're like, okay, we'll put him in this fridge and then we'll bury him tomorrow. Yeah, we'll bury him tomorrow. We'll figure out what to do with him tomorrow. So yeah, they do that and then they leave him and they all go home and go to bed. And the next morning they wake up and they go over to the auntie who is the bakery baker and she's in a tizzy about something. So they're all like, what's happened? And she's like, the people have been for the fridges which have the cake and the ingredients in, the wedding. And they took all the fr- all the fridges that were in here. So the dead body has been transported to the wedding venue. So like, oh no, that's not good. <laughs> so they all try throughout the wedding to frantically get rid of this body and try and get it back to the bakery where it was originally was. So no one finds out about this body. The hotel owner is actually Nathan, who she broke up with all them years ago. 
and it's a blast from the past and he kind of figures out what's going on so yeah basically it's Medi and her aunties and her mum trying to dispose of this body while putting together a wedding and all the other chaos that happens there's a robbery happening as well Medi gets set up for this robbery so she's trying to avoid like charges for that and trying to avoid charges for murder um, and trying not to get caught all while trying to win our ex back because she's still in love with him and yeah it's all a bit hectic really everything goes to plan and they actually get away with it which is pretty weird and now we're seeing Nathan and Maddie get back together but yeah really enjoyed it really good book really cool story really funny the aunties in the minds like everyone's just so funny they're just such funny characters they had me this book had me howling man it was so funny I just love the anti-characters, they're all amazing. Yeah, I really like the story, really solidly written. And it was cool to see like a bit of Indonesian and like, Chinese and Asian culture in a book. But yeah, I gave this one four stars and I highly enjoyed it. So that was the first book I read for the month of November. Okay guys, the second book I read for the month of November was the next one in this series, which was Four Aunties in a Wedding. Yeah, this one is about Nathan and Maddie's wedding. They are getting married. They meet these wedding vendors who her aunties have her aunties and her mum have set her up with. She goes and meets them over a meal and she really falls in love with these vendors. Like what they're showing her in their portfolio of like the hair and the makeup, the cake, the flowers, all looks really, really promising and really good. So she's like, Yeah, we'll hire these guys. They're really cool. They're they've got some really good portfolio here so i think we should hire them so her and nathan both agreed to hire these people for the wedding leading up to the wedding her and the photographer stephanie become really really close and like friends they fly over to the uk for the wedding and obviously the aunties and her mom are being embarrassing as always trying to learn english slang and they obviously don't understand what half the English slang that they're talking about means. So they embarrass that all over again in front of Nathan's parents, who they're meeting for the first time the night before the wedding's happening. Obviously, Nathan's staying somewhere else, and she's staying in a hotel with her aunties, her mom, and her best friends. And obviously, Stephanie, who is the photographer, because they've become really good friends. So Stephanie and her two friends and Medi all go out on the drink the night before and cool they have a nice night and then Medi has some presents for all of her friends and Stephanie she's like right I'm gonna have to go ho go back to the hotel and go to bed because obviously I'm up early in the morning because it's my Wednesday. Our friend Selena and Seb stay back and they party but Stephanie comes with her and goes yeah because I have to get up as well because I'm part of the wedding as well because I'm the photographer. They, wa they walk each other back to the hotel. Stephanie's actually staying somewhere else so she's like okay well I'll see you tomorrow. I'm excited for your wedding day and I'm sure you are too. She's like, oh yeah, yeah, so the part ways. And then Medi forgets that she was meant to give Stephanie a present. So she f chases Stephanie down, and, but Stephanie's on the phone talking about assassinating someone and that the target's going to be there and the wedding's going ahead so the tar they can get rid of this target. She like catches up and goes, what was all that about? Target who? What do you mean? What's happening? So Stephanie's like, well, we're mafia and we've got someone to kill at your wedding. That's why we're talking the gig for your wedding. So if you call off your wedding, we'll go to the authorities and tell them that you killed that guy. Because we've got enough evidence on you to get you convicted and your mum and your aunties and Nathan all convicted because he was all part of it. So she freaks out and she's like, okay, fine, I'll have the wedding. And she tries to find out, along with her aunties and her mum, who the target is, so they can help protect the target, basically make a wedding go to plan. But come the day of the wedding, chaos just ensues every single time. Lots of things just go wrong. Medi's like MIA for half of our wedding, and so Nathan becomes very suspicious, and he's like, what the heck's going on? But obviously she can't tell him because the threats that Stephanie's made. Medi kind of figures out along with her aunties who it is and they protect the target for a lot of the night they think is it, who they think is the target they protect for a lot of the night and then many kind of pieces together that that person that they were protecting all along wasn't actually the target and she kind of figures out that the family who took the vendor gig at a wedding 
are actually the family of the guy that she killed in the first book. And they want revenge because they know she done it. Because the grandma believes that he was a good boy, he was a sweet boy, he wouldn't hurt anyone. But the rest of the family were keeping his bad side from her because they didn't want her to know that he wasn't a really nice person and that he was like a bit of a misfit and he got in with the wrong people and he would like do loads of bad things and just like I didn't kill him on purpose he actually tried to ask Amy and that's the reason that he died because he was trying to assault me and I tasered him and that it just snowballed from there so the families kind of start to understand and the uncles and Stephanie come clean about what kind of person he really was and makes the grandma say like he wasn't a very nice person. They just kept that side from her so she wouldn't be disappointed. They kind of like bury the hatchet and they understand each other. Um, I also give this one a four stars. Really enjoyed it. It wasn't as good as the first book but it was still funny and it was still a really good story. It was an interesting story. I didn't expect the family to be the family of the guy who was murdered in the first book. I legitly thought were mafia and they were there to assassinate someone. That was the five books I read for the two months of October and November. I hope you guys enjoyed listening to this video and seeing what I read, what they were about and what my ratings were. But yeah, I'm going to end this one here, guys. Hope you enjoyed it. And yeah, I'll catch you guys in the next one. Please, if you like this video, then do smash the like button down below. And I will see you guys in the next live stream of video. Peace out, guys, for tonight. We have another video.